I mean, I've been paid so little for the past five years. It's about time that I can use the company funds, right? Well, it depends. Am I invited to the exercise classes? Of course, if you say yes. If I did go with you, I'd probably end up in jail, so... Today, we have a special guest on our show. Who's that? I'm not telling you. Hi, my name is Vaisho. I'm a startup lawyer from Founders. And I'm Swang Wijaya, disputes lawyer from Eugene Theresingham. Eugene Theresingham LLP? Yeah, why? Because our special guest today is Eugene Theresingham himself. Hi, hi, hi everyone. Hi, Rachel, Swang. Um, thank you very much for having me on. So Rachel, let's talk about crime, right? That's why you have me on today. That's right. And together with Swang, who is an expert in these things and in all things legal. So, well, or illegal since we're talking about crime. So uh, let's start off then. Uh, what would you like to know? What would you like our audience to know? Okay, the first question I have is that if I'm a startup founder and I'm preparing a pitch deck, can I exaggerate the numbers in the pitch deck? For example, if I know that my startup will have difficulties achieving a $100 million revenue. Can I put that in my info memo? So let me try to understand your question. What you're really saying is that your company actually does not produce any revenue. It loses money. For now, yeah. And you want to lie to people and tell them that uh, it's actually producing some money and in fact it's producing $80 million. And uh, whether if you do that, you're being not just being naughty or whether it's a criminal offence, is that what you're asking? Yes, maybe you're not trying to lie, but maybe you feel that, okay, with your investment, I can then achieve $80 million in revenue. That's something I hope to achieve after many milestones I met, but I'm not fully confident. Are there any like um, things I should be aware of? So let's talk about an example, a real life example that we've read in the newspapers. I think uh, at least one case, a startup guy, what he has done is he informed the public, members of the public, that he's able to buy a particular metal at a cheap price and sell it in another market at a higher price and therefore profiting from the arbitrage. So he tells this to investors. Investors invest into his company. So Swang, can you tell us, um, did he do something wrong? And if so, uh, what are the legalities? What potential offences may have been committed? Well, to answer that question, the investigations have uh, gone against him and uh, they have been uh, found to have made these representations knowing that they are false. So he has now been subject to various criminal charges, especially of cheating, and uh, various civil proceedings have also been commenced against him by both the liquidators of the company, which he was using to perpetrate this fraud, as well as by uh, some investors. Since we are on the topic of cheating, what exactly is cheating? What you tell people, not true, okay? It's a lie. And people think what you say is true. And because of that, they put money in. Now that's cheating because you have lied to someone, they have relied on your lie, and they have acted to their own loss or to your gain. So that is the definition of cheating. But sometimes life isn't so straightforward and clear. Sometimes founders do strongly believe that they want to achieve a particular milestone. But perhaps, you know, they may not be fully confident in that. So would you advise them to either be aware of certain offences that could be uh, charged against them or maybe give them some tips in terms of, you know, putting in a disclaimer in the pitch deck to protect themselves? Uh, you're right, absolutely right. The law is, can sometimes be scary and difficult. But let's look at a, at a more grey um, example, something which is a bit more complicated. The facts are these. So I'm a company, say I want to contract with Rachel. And um, Rachel wants to know whether I am using any subcontractors and how much I'll be paying my subcontractors. She has told me that's important to her in deciding how much to pay me for my services since quite a bit of the work is going to be done by subcontractors. So I tell her, look, I have three subcontractors. I'm going to pay each of them $10 an hour. Rachel, is that okay? $10 yeah. an hour? Yeah, that's All right. great. So I've told that's you I have three contractors and I'm paying each of them $10 an hour. And we have sat down, we've agreed on the price for the contract. Now, now Rachel, close your ears. 
So what I did not so what I did not tell Rachel close stay closed. What I did not tell Rachel is that these three contractors are each giving me back two dollars an hour. That's naughty of you. Mm, terrible. So Swang, that's so we know we know that's wrong. So Rachel, you didn't hear any of this, but Swang, you know that's wrong. So can you explain to our audience why charges for cheating may be brought? So in normal circumstances, uh, the law does not require you to disclose all the facts and normally you are criminalized only if you clearly say something that is false. But sometimes there are exceptional circumstances where the court takes the view that even if the facts that you state are factually accurate, your failure to disclose certain other facts or to disclose the full context may give off such a misleading picture that it amounts to cheating under law and the court may in such a situation still find you guilty of cheating this time by willful omission and that will be a criminal offence under section 415 and associated sections of the penal code. But let's dig a little deeper. Um, for a lot of startup founders, they have not even launched a business. So they go to the market with an idea saying that I want to build the next um, rap sharing app. And in that instance, they then make certain assumptions in a pitch deck saying that, okay, assuming with I have 50,000 users, I think I, have, I will have $50 million in revenue. That's a pretty um, honest representation from their side. but. In that instance, do you think there should be any protections that founders should take for themselves or any offences they should be aware of before they make these broad representations? Yeah, you have to be very careful when you make representations. In fact, I've, I've read through a number of prospectuses. They always say, look, the, the company does not make money. Uh, it may not make money in future. In fact, it may never ever make money. But this is our business model. Please invest. So, I mean, if, if a false statement is made and a statement which you know is false and someone acts on it to his loss or to your gain, there's a problem. Um, elements of cheating are made up because, you know, you had a dishonest intention. You, you knew you are saying something false. So it has to be an understanding between investors and startup founders that this is a high-risk investment on one hand. And on the other hand, startup founders also have a duty not to lie in your pitch deck. So if you truly think that this is going to be a very difficult figure to achieve, um, either put a little footnote there or a disclaimer there or try to make representations which you think is reasonably achievable. What about Eugene? If I'm a startup founder and a poorly paid startup founder and I've just done a $10 million raise, can I possibly use some of the funds uh, from that raise to sponsor my exercise classes or maybe some of the fees from my wedding? I mean, I've been paid so little for the past five years, it's about time that I can use the company funds, right? Well, it depends. Am I invited to the exercise classes? Of course, if you say yes. If I did go with you, I'd probably end up in jail. So I would you know, respectfully decline this inv invitation and I'll turn it over to Swang Swang. If Rachel did this, if she raised money from investors, she decides, oh yeah, small thing lah. You know, I go for my, for my, you, I, I think you like the cycling thing, I right? love the cycling thing. What's it called again? Absolute I forgot. cycle. Ah, <laughs> yes. So if, if she were to spend $40 or $50 out, you know, small amount out of all that amount of money which she has raised to pay for a cycling class, what's wrong legally, Swang? What's going to happen to her? My legalistic answer is, you would be found guilty of criminal breach of trust. <gasps> Shocking. They'll put you in prison depending oh, no. on how much money you have put in and even a small amount of money can land you quite lengthy imprisonment term. And even worse, uh, you are now a founder and a director of the company and you have misappropriated the company's funds. You'll be found liable for an aggravated form of criminal breach of trust called criminal breach of trust as agent, which would increase the imprisonment sentence even further. So basically what I've done is actually to steal something and it's a more aggravated form of stealing because I'm in a position of trust. People have invested money with me for a particular purpose and then I've gone to sapu some of this money and I went for my, you know, well, I won't go for cycling. I went uh, for on... golf. Oh, or no, drinking. no. <laughs> Let's not go there. I went on a fishing trip oh. using that money. So that would really be, I have let my investors down. I have used the money for something I shouldn't have. Again, I'd be naughty and not allowed, right? 
But can I chip on this a bit further? Can I try to defend myself? Uh, when I was working in large corporations, they have wellness policies. They have, you know, they do pay for some of the massages that uh, staff goes for. Um, they even have a wedding ang pao allowance. So why, if that happened at at MNC level, why can't I apply it to myself? That's a good question you asked, Rachel. You had me stumped for a while. I think it's really a question of disclosure. Because if you secretly take the money, go for your spin class, and I think that's stealing. But uh, if it's if there's procedure, investors know that this amount of money goes towards the staff policy of having parties in the office every Friday night. I think that's acceptable because there's no dishonest, there's no dishonest intention. There's no intention to deceive investors. And it's part and parcel of running a business. You've got to keep your employees happy. So, so how many points do I get out of this out of 100? 100? Oh, Nothing wow. more to add from me. You're too kind. How about this, um, Eugene and Song? If I am a startup founder and I really want to win this government tender, can I bring um, the officials out for you know a nice meal at Cut and then a night out at Marquee? Or do you think that's something that is out of... Scope. No, 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 never do that. You can't do that because that would be perceived as a corrupt act. Uh, what you're trying to do is you're trying to buy influence. You're trying to influence the officials to make life easier for you. At least that's how it'll be construed and that's the offence of corruption. Now, we start by speaking about corruption this way. What if I pose to Swang this scenario? Policeman comes to your house because he's conducting an uh, in investigation in relation to a crime which someone's committed against you. So it's in your interest for the policeman to investigate thoroughly and get to the bottom of the matter. It's a hot day. You offer him a glass of water. Is that corruption? Speaking in legal terms first, this act of offering water, yes, it's just an act of hospitality, but it does not cause the policeman to subvert his duties as a policeman or to show some favour to me, which uh, he isn't supposed to show to me. So if I change the fact scenario, I up it up since I'm feeling hungry. So let's use this example. Um, policeman comes to your house. You tell the policeman, oh, I've prepared a nice steak. Come and join me. Let's have lunch together. Now, can or cannot? It goes into a more grey area now, okay? Although you are not explicitly saying, ah, if, uh, see, if you accept my hospitality, you will do things in my favour. But the fact that I'm offering you a much more specialised meal, more hospitality than would be the norm, the court may infer into this situation that I am trying to use my hospitality to you to buy your influence to get you to subvert your duties as a policeman and do something in my favour. So what you're trying to say, Swang, is that really sometimes corruption is very, it's, it's difficult to detect because nobody or rather very few people overtly say, look, I offer you this in return for that. But, base, but people try to uh, subtly um, influence another person to act to you know, my benefit, uh, to the detriment of you know whoever you represent, be it the government or the company, is that what you are trying to explain to our audience? Yes, because in most situations, the court will not be dealing with a situation where the accused is explicitly making his intentions known. It's always inferring from the circumstances. So, if a policeman ever comes to my place, I'd be like, no water for you, and no steak for you, because that's what you guys said. <laughs> <laughs> what about this scenario? I'm a startup founder and I'm under a lot of pressure from my investors to deliver. I mean, I just produced that pitch deck that said I'm going to make $100 million this year. Can I then create, you know, invoices to my boyfriend's company, increasing the, the numbers that appears on my books to perhaps improve the confidence of my investors? and then sort this out later. Is that something I can do? Oh, I see. We are coming back to cheating again, Rachel. I'm trying not to cheat. Very naughty. But let me, let, me try to, let me try to elaborate and expand a little bit on what you've said. So I think we've come across another real life example as well. Somebody um, claimed to have a product, a medical product, 
and the medical product unfortunately did not work as well as what um, it was taught to be able to do. So uh, instead of the founder coming clean and saying, look, I'm sorry, I've let you down. Um, this product actually does not work. What she has then done is she has gone to gone on to fake the performance, the fake, fake the good performance of this product, and continued to fundraise from the public. So I've already given the hint. But Swang, can you explain what offence and why? Well, uh, first there's the general offence of cheating when you also go further and create documents to come up with false appearances and especially when it comes to accounting documents or documents to do with revenues you may become liable for falsification of books and accounts under section 477a of the penal code but can i defend myself by saying you know that these are invoices issued to my boyfriend if things don't work out you know maybe he would just pay for the invoices can i do that no oh, that's a sham that's a sham it's called a sham in law and I thought that's called allowed. sugar daddy. <laughs> <laughs> I pity your boyfriend. <laughs> Is there not going to be any like legal points coming in? I pity my boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So, let's talk about uh, laundering, Rachel. And I don't mean um, laundrette. Uh, no, 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 no. We're not. We're not taking any clothes to the laundry. What we wanted to talk about is what is money laundering, and should you as a startup boss, a startup employee, a startup investor, be concerned about this thing called money laundering. Swang, what is money laundering? Money laundering essentially involves uh, receiving funds uh, without doing your proper KYC checks or checking that the funds don't come from illegal or suspicious sources. You accept them into your accounts and then you issue checks so that now uh, the funds appear to be clean because they have gone through your accounts. So Rachel, let me let me see if I can pose you this question. You know, I need a small favor. I have um, a little bit of money, you know, and I have an uncle in uh, Myanmar, and he's not feeling too well. So I need the money sent to him. Can I transfer this money into your startup? And you do me a small favor. You send the money to the account in Myanmar. I'll give you the account number. Could you do that for me, please? After that, I'll send your clothes for laundry. I I would definitely give you my personal pay now number and then run away with your money. Oh, that is, that is a crime in itself. But maybe maybe I'll turn it over to Swang. Swang, how, how would you advise Rachel? So, in a situation where the circumstances give rise to red flags or suspicious or questions in your mind, you have a duty to just ask the person to explain to you why this needs to be done. And in situations where the person does not satisfactorily ask or alleviate your suspicions, uh, you should not uh, proceed with the transaction. And in the most extreme circumstances, you may even come under duty to make a suspicious transaction report to the well, CAD. I think that that's an important point and it's something which I wanted to bring up. So let's turn the scenario a bit different. So I put the money into Rachel's bank account first. And she doesn't run away with the money, not this time. And then Rachel realizes, eh, she's received fifty thousand dollars from, and and I haven't told her that I put the money in there yet. I was hoping to catch her in a good mood to ask for the favor, but she comes across this fifty thousand in her bank account. What should she do? Spend it on bags. Not enough for your bags, Rachel. <laughs> um, but why should I care? I mean, if if someone, you know, transfers fifty thousand to me and I spend it. Out. Why do I have to care? Because that's a transaction from A to B, and I just ah, happen to be. Ah, huge problems. A. Not just a money laundering issue, but also um, it's a question of what if the person had put who put it into your bank account was someone who was scamming people. So if he was going around scamming people, he's not going to use his own bank account. He's scared of getting caught. So he has told everyone, look. Um, transfer the money to this bank account and that's your company's bank account. So all the victims of the scam have transferred these monies into your bank account and now he comes and tells you, oh, um, actually all this money uh, is for my ill uncle in Myanmar 
can you please send it on to him? Now, it's so suspicious because you would have seen entries from various people, smaller amounts, and he's telling you that it's his money and he wants you to send it to Myanmar when it's something that, you know, he does not need to involve your company in. Now, what if you then, being good-natured, you think you want to do him a favour and you send the money to Myanmar? Or for you, more likely, you know, it's another Hermes bag, right? With the 50,000. So, Suan, can you tell us what happens? Well, uh, from the most basic level, if you actually know that the funds coming to your account is stolen funds or illegally obtained funds, you come under uh, an offence of knowingly receiving uh, stolen proceeds of crime. But even in a situation where actually your mindset is completely innocent, where you are so gullible that you really uh, believe what the person putting you funds is saying. It's really for my sick uncle, Swang. Yes, even in that situation, the situation would have come up with so many red flags that any other reasonable person who is not so gullible would have asked so many questions from the requester. The court can still impose criminal liability for you because you have reason to believe that funds were stolen or illegal. So Rachel, moral of the story? Don't spend money. No. <laughs> Be careful. Know that your source of money. Dig deeper and find out the truth of where this money came from. Yes, yeah, so for startup founders out there, it's not just about earning money, but understanding where your revenue comes from. And it's important to know where your revenue comes from because you could just find yourself behind the bars. Swang, let me ask you this scenario, okay? So you run a professional services company and a client calls and says that, look, he wants a simple one-page agreement drawn up. But he says he's, he likes you a lot because you've helped him a lot in the past. And he also wants to engage your services more in future. So this time he tells you that, look, Swang, even though it's just a one-page agreement, I'm going to pay you $50,000 for the agreement. Now, you would usually charge much less than that, but he's offering to pay $50,000. Rachel, $50,000. I'm a lot. taking it. Yeah. <laughs> so... The money comes into your account. Then he calls you and he says, Swang, actually, I don't want to do this deal anymore. I don't need the one-page agreement. You know, I'm so sorry to have taken up your time. And I feel so bad that I've taken up your time. So you keep 5000 but you refund me 45000 uh, I'll give you a new account, a new bank account for you to refund the money to. As the owner of the business, should you just proceed to send a refund to the bank account that he gives he gives you you definitely should not okay and you may be liable for offenses under the cdsa which is a short form for a very complicated legislation called corruption drug trafficking and other serious offenses proceeds of crime brackets act but strong i don't understand it's his money he has put it in my account he now wants the money back in fact he'll sue me if i don't give him the money back right this is where we come back to the principle that I was talking about earlier. Even if you have a gullible mindset or an innocent mindset and you feel that there's nothing wrong in a transaction, a reasonable person in your shoes would have seen that this is somebody that is just coming up with a fake request for services to put a lot of money into your account and then coming up with a fake reason to say uh, he wants a significant refund back and he's asking for it to be transferred to a different account. Any reasonable person would see that it is so suspicious uh, that a person would not proceed with the transaction and report the matter to the police. And if you don't do that, even if your mindset is completely innocent and you did not actually participate in the crime, uh, you may be liable for offences. So I can't keep the $5,000 even if I agree to split it 50-50 with Rachel? You should just not return him any of the 45000 <laughs> Yeah, but um, you're right. Um, there are a lot of things that startup founders should be aware of when operating a business. Um, something that seemingly looks so innocent could really get you into a lot of trouble if you don't apply certain checks and balances in your business. And common sense, I suppose. Yes, not everyone has common sense. It's quite common. <laughs> That's all for today and we hope you enjoyed this video. We're so lucky to have Eugene from Eugene Thrusting Income LLP with us today and we hope startup founders have learned so much from this video because I surely did about how much money I cannot accept 
from people and how I should never offer a policeman any water or steak because Eugene said that. Water is fine. <laughs> okay. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, go to foundersdoc.com. That's where I always go. Oh, I love it. <laughs> Bye. See you guys. Bye-bye.